So, Jim, we, we hit the quarter bin sale recently at one of our uh, comic book holes, man. And, of course, once there's a quarter bin sale and there's maybe a thousand boxes to go through during said sale, you have to at least produce one long box to bring back <laughs> home. And uh, Do you get a price break on the long box? Here's where we break kayfabe. The, the comics individually, 30 cents. I asked him for the deal because I'm like, I'll, I'll make you count all of these if you just don't, like, hook me up. And dude's like, how many fit in the box? I was honest. I said about 300 He said, $80. I said, 75 He said, that was the second, that was the second thought I was th- thinking. Uh, and then I filled this motherfucker to the brim. There were, like, maybe a 1,000 boxes down there. Jim, I spent seven hours down there. I, I, was, I, was, I was hoping I was hoping to actually come out with a 1,000 comics. I, I was going to produce three long boxes of stuff. That was going to be my personal limit. I'd be like a month of programming on our channel. <laughs> but it was, as uh, the great Method Man said, it was slim pickings on my Charles Dickens. <laughs> but the final tally ended up getting uh, 388 books for $75. That rounds out to about 20 cents per issue. <laughs> and you know that's what we like to do. Yes. <laughs> Starting off. Uh, this is a troubling book to start with. It is. Uh, because it's thick. You get too many of these in your long box, you might be looking at like 24 cents, 25 cents in that danger zone of uh, maybe coming out behind. I was very nervous, and uh, this was a pile. Like, I basically put the long box together and had a stack sitting on top. But then... Your homeboy, Eddie P., found ways to get these things to fit into the box. But I never heard of this manga, and I thought it looks really beautiful. It does look nice. I, I have seen some of these, but I haven't read this. But early, you know, early uh, manga import. Yeah, so we have that. Um, Rich Kozlowski was one of the few independent uh, cartoonists that would come through the Pittsburgh Comic Con. And he first... One year he put out uh, the, the the Geek's Guide to Picking Up Girls, and I think it went really well for him. And then I think he may have gotten a Zerek, I'm not sure. But he then came with three issues of the three geeks from his Three Finger Prints uh, comic book company. And when I saw these down there, I read the first three and I enjoyed them. If you can't get Eltingville, if, if Evan <laughs> Dorkin ain't doing Eltingville at a clip that you need, you know, you round out a box with this. Autographed? Or is that printed on there? I guess I should get these CG seed. <laughs> 39 nice. Screams. Have you ever seen this? I have seen this. I love the covers. Yeah, I don't know it so well. So this is uh, an opportunity to educate yourself. Whenever you have a cheapo sale like this and there's stuff you've never seen before. This stuff looks pretty good. And in terms of those cheap sales, like for quarter books, my rule now is... If I'm thinking about it, it goes in the take-home pile. Sure. Especially for 20 cents. And with books like this, you may never see them again. I like this philosophy, Jim, and I have added to your philosophy. And it is sometimes there may be books there that you may already own. So you have to perform a rescue mission. You can't just leave those there for some punk square to pick up. Action Force, amazing. Great cover. Yeah, and it doesn't look so bad. Like, that's, you know... John Severin is for like right like it totally looks Severinish. It's it's pretty high level of craft, which can as we've said in the past can sometimes work against it. I like the oddity. This one looks like somebody who probably worked at Marvel or DC at some. But it's point. odd enough. It's weird enough to capture my interest, and some of that could be accounted for in the lettering. Like if they if this was same artwork produced in the mid '90s with that same bullshit lettering font <laughs> right. that everybody used, I wouldn't have picked it up. You will find none of that in this box. Great cover. Very Mike Zack. We're going to be covering a distant soil in Wizard episodes uh, on Palmer's picks, so I figured I'll, I'd scoop scoop some of these up, man. Have Co- you read any of these? I have. I've read a, a couple of trades that were put out by Image, and they're they're pretty cool. I, I dig them. Our uh, art looks really nice. Yeah, and that's Colleen Duran. Is, is oh yeah, we should is say the that. is the artist. I picked this one up because issue one. Mm-hmm. Why not start at the beginning? But I picked these up. Because of the PandaCon backup, uh, <laughs> the backup stories, I uh, and it says introducing PandaCon, so it's like, Ooh. whoa, was it PandaCon's first appearance? And I had the action figure when I was a little dude, and it was much later when I discovered that it was an actual comic. So, uh, whenever I see PandaCon comics out there in the wild, I will pick them up and I will read them and I will enjoy. By the them. way, Warp Graphics, mm-hmm. how insecure are you that you have to slap your logo on on uh, four times on a two-page spread? <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> 
So, PandaCon, there we go. That, that's the reason why I had to scoop these babies up. Here's a weird one. I've never seen this. That's a great cover. It really is. Two-page spreader, man. This looks like something that would have been an animated MTV series in, in the 90s. Yeah, when you say that, it gives it a, a good context. Very Beavis and Butthead, Mike Judge kind of art in some ways. And Winter 95 puts it much later than I would have expected. Oh, there's, there's, there's extras in there. Man, and the inside looks like the cover. Yeah, which so, which doesn't always happen. No, like, a lot of times it doesn't happen. They, they put all their energy into the cover, and then you get disappointed with the interior. Really, really like this stuff. Yeah. Looks great. Where is this out of? That's a good question. Illinois Carp Carpentersville. But we'll keep we'll keep a close eye uh, on the comics that we pull out uh, in the box because there is something that came from Irwin, PA, and I don't remember wh what it was. Interesting. Do you know Tim Bear? Of is that a cartoonist you recognize? No, but when you see comics like this, uh, you got to Google the name. Yes. You know, this is a name to Google because this is, I cannot imagine that this is somebody who's just like, that's enough. Yeah, yeah that, right. that, that, yeah, that yeah. was fun. I think I'll be done now. Yeah, there's a, a lifetime of drawing before this issue, and I'm sure it doesn't stop at the end of this issue. That's a good one. I would definitely pick that up if I come across it. I think it was Alex number four that might have been in my pile of, you know, my first hundred comics. And uh, please uh, don't hold the fact that it's thunderstorming against us. Um, but always dug uh, that issue, issue number four. My, my uncle, he would hit, hit the swap meets, he would hit the flea markets and just buy comics. He had no prejudice to anything. And I have been, you know, hoarding black and white comics so I was a freaking little boy, man. So this one looks good. This is one you can find. Fanographics, obviously, a pedigree. I think it gets covered at some point in Palmer's picks, and uh, I have a couple of these as well. It's that weird area of like anamorphic. You, you, uh, it's an animal character, but for no apparent reason. Right. <laughs> Alpha wave. Dark line. Uh, I think Dark Adventures is the. Uh, the other comic that really rules from these dudes. 1987 color you don't see too often. No. Probably marker. It's got a good look. It's it's this is what I like in these in these weird books. Dark Adventures is a fun comic, you know, like these guys are so earnest in what they're doing and it's you know they 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 miss the mark a lot, but this was an era where, you know, you were growing up, uh, Dark Angel, excuse yes. me, um, where you, these guys were growing up, they wanted to be pencilers, you know? Pretty pretty good page there. Almost like a Daredevil versus the Claw kind of guy. Good shit. Nice back cover, too. America's Nemesis of Evil. Dark Alliance a good brand. I, 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 think, I think I'll pick up anything from them. <laughs> Ape City. A lot, series. Of, a lot of Planet of the Apes comics throughout the I, I picked this history. up for, for one reason, um, and it was because I came across issue three before I came across these first two. It's the humans. Wow. It does look like the humans. That looks great. Yeah. It's, it's really good looking stuff. And you will see, like, I wonder if Keenan Marshall Keller and Tom Neely, like, could it be one of the other issues that... <laughs> The, the one with the guy on the motorcycle doesn't have the good motorcycle gang piece. This looks amazing. Like, I like lo several of these pages. No, yeah, th this is good stuff, man. This is good stuff, and I look forward to uh, to reading it. But I, when, you, when I saw this, I'm like, oh, shit, this is, you know, proto-humans. Absolutely. Art Bay by Jessica Abel. I discovered her through Palmer's Picks, and I had, uh, this is called Volume 2, Number 4, put up by Fantagraphics. I have volume one, number one through three. I had no idea there was a volume two, and let alone I had no idea there was a number four. have no idea how far this went up, but I absolutely love the original Art Babe series and some I'm of the other work she's fan. done. Uh, I found her stuff probably about the same time, Ed, and it's nonfiction comics. It's like journalism comics. It's a lot of stuff that I just didn't see in comics. I think she comes out of the Chicago area, and one of my favorite comics ever is Radio and Illustrated Guide that she did in conjunction with Ira Glass from This American Life, where it just goes through the process of putting together an episode of This American Life. So, yeah, I'm a Jessica Abel fan from, from this era as well. Ashley Dust, Rick McCollum. Nice. Another guy that... Uh, was one of those staples of 1980s comics who really... That's incredible. ...worked his ass off. 
I'll say, it's such a clean of? line, and man, the obsession. This is in that rain nest kind of zone where it is just, it's obsession, and you can see it on these pages like, goodness, wow. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one, man. Not one I've seen before. Really, when, really cool. When I go through these comics, like, you know, I'm picking up Rick, any Rick McCollum. I always find a Rick McCollum comic that I never knew existed. Uh, I always find a Tim Tyler comic that I never yeah. knew existed. And we'll, we'll see several of those through here. Atomic City Tales, Jay Stevens. Once again, another guy I discovered by way of Palmer's Picks. Maybe my first issue of Wizard ever. And this, to me, is like an iconic character. I don't mm -hmm. know the character's name, but, uh, you know, he was drawn on, like, Mad Men covers. Uh, Jay Stevens did some, like, backups and shit in THB. Uh, these guys were all connected in some way. I haven't read much of his work, and I look forward to reading this thing, man. Yeah, I, I know people that are big fans of his, kind of in the vein of a Mike Allred. Yeah. Uh, especially for this time period. So, good-looking comics. I'm going to call it AZ-1, Kamiko. And uh, as far as I can tell, this is like a very, very early Kamiko comic. And that's the reason why I, I grabbed it. Because uh, Kamiko known mostly probably from like uh, Grendel, Mage, uh, early American manga. with Ro They got the Robotech license very early. Did they do Elementals? They, uh, they did. They did do Elementals. It's weird to see this stuff and think of Kamiko as like kind of a legitimate publisher. You know, they were in business throughout the mid 80s into the maybe even the early 90s and would have like five year book, you know, that was like kind of an overview of the company's history and stuff. They had editorial staff like it was a, a, a regular publishing operation. But this one looks like any 80s black and white book. Here's some rescue mission pieces. Awesome. I've been wanting to see these since we talked to Tim Vigil. Yeah, so you don't have these? I don't. Okay, the reason I bought these is because I, I do have them, and uh, I'm going to give them to somebody. Let me dig out mine and make sure that I have them and can find them, and then if uh, I locate them, these are yours. Cool. Yeah, by all means. Like, that's a Tim Vigil uh, piece of artwork if I've ever seen them. That's Bruce Tim Color. Wow. That's B that BT? Yeah, yeah. And of course he relaxed the crazy obsessive line because it was going to be in color. Nice. Very cool to see that. Badger's an interesting one. There's some there's some cool Badger stuff uh, throughout his history. Different artists and things of interest. There you go. North Star is funny as fuck to me because I think I have maybe three North Star comics. Vince Locke there? That have this fucking yes. story in it, man. Splatter, best of James O'Barr, best of North Star. They really uh, gild, gild the lily. I picked up a Gasm at Heroes, mm -hmm. a black and white magazine, and it's 1978 and has early O'Barr in it. He's signing his name as Zen. Wow. And I wonder if that's like his earliest stuff. It has to be. On, uh, on eBay at this very moment, there is a uh, James O'Barr sample pages of x-men wow from the 70s that's pretty wild yeah this was uh vince Locke is one of those guys that i really got into early because of dead world yes yeah and he he was connected uh pretty closely with uh, guy davis yes. they did the baker street miniseries that is funny about that story being and everything <laughs> can't have vigil you can't have can't have uh outlaw comic without some vigil piece man and I that's just... a hardcore piece man I, i've seen this on ebay too as like the big poster and uh i think about it i think about it a lot it would look nice next to my electra assassin poster <laughs> my wife would just never come in that room again <laughs> right <laughs> oh sweet yeah. yeah black mask this is something uh we've we've talked about wrestling comics we've talked about korean comics this combines both and i had had a k faber give me a copy of this issue at heroes yeah, it was it was uh, it was in my mind, and I basically will grab anything from Eastern Comics. I have yeah. I have a ton of these things. Um, I and I may actually have one or two of these, but if they're there, it's twenty cents, man. Yeah, Eastern is not a company I see covered ever. Never. I like Black Moon a lot, and I like issue two is actually the best of the run in my opinion. Is that what this is? Yes. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, but. You, you you see a weird cover like this, and you get excited. You open it up, and then you're like, oh, this is a bet, man. This is coming home with me. So good. Like, this is your shot. This is your shot. When you're 13, that's every hero you want crouched on the rooftop about to jump into battle. It's good stuff. And great coloring on the cover. That looks like, to me, markers, probably. You can see some of the overlap of the color. Yep. 
Here's another rescue mission. Damn straight. This is such a good pool. First time I saw these was at a Masamoto art exhibit in, in Toronto. And so Viz reprinted or, or imported Tekken Kingcrete, but published it under the name Black and White. And they did a couple of volumes as collections that must not have sold well. So my understanding is this five issue series kind of finished off that story in a format that they hoped to sell better. So cool, though, to have Masamoto comic books, man. You know, like, yeah. how awesome. These, these are some formative comics for me. Some amazing, like, early manga for me that spoke to me. I understood it. And uh, it's great to see them in this format. Yeah. Just beautiful. And, and K-Favors out there, Black and White, the, the comic, you got to dig in the bins for that. But this is very uh, accessible. And it has everything in one. Um, including color pages. Yeah, gorgeous edition, easily accessible you, too. You gotta get your hands on it, and I do not doubt that we will color, cover this more thoroughly on the Kayfabe channel in the future. Yeah, that's a classic. To get these five of them for a dollar is what you paid for this run. Yeah. I don't think you're beating it, Ed. Not at all, man. Blackjack, uh, uh, Osama Tezuka, one yeah, of his flagships. Pretty comments. good. Yeah, pretty good follow up. <laughs> A lot best? of people cite that whenever I was first learning about manga, that was cited often as like his his best. Probably because it's what was available in English, but really right. good comics. I uh, put together my Black Zeppelin run of Gene uh, Day comics that were from probably like Charlton Bullseye and wow. fanzines and and places like that. That was some white screen time. Published by, uh, I guess this would te technically be uh, Denny Luber. Yeah, but... Mm -hmm. Uh, Gene Day was closely associated with Dave Sim for many years. There was a uh, small press and uh, comics expo in Columbus, Ohio. There would be the Day Prize. Dave Sim would present the Day Prize. And uh, they they published a lot of the works that Gene Day owned. Yeah, and, and kayfabers at home may recognize Gene Day's name through his run on Masters of Kung Fu that are amazing comics. Sometimes you grab a comic for the title. Yeah, I, Blood Junkies on Capitol Hill. Great cover, though. I like that cover, the purple-yellow title. Good cover, and this Brooks Hagen, I believe, may have been the person who did that Ape City. But Brooks Hagen oh, has wow. several comics in here, and they that all look good. pretty good. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's a name that's now on my radar. Amazing. This is stuff that I would normally gloss over, and now it's on my list. What a spread. What a, what a two-page spread right there. That's a money shot, man. Yeah. <laughs> wow. There's that another could be a big image today. There's another comic I, in this that I bought for the title, and I think you guys will immediately know it when you see it. And it's not this one, Blood Masters. No, but that's a hell of a title. Yeah. That would sell me. I like these vampire comics, man. This looks good, Ed. Yeah. I like a truck in a comic, too. You don't see a lot of those. Hard to draw. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's fun, man. It has a little bit of the Galacy, has a little this bit of This is a find. Mm -hmm. I would be thrilled to take this one home. Good stuff. For a second, I thought it was Ken Langrove. Jeff right. McClellan. Pretty cool. Had no idea Blood Rain went up to issue eight. Yeah, or, yeah it or, does. or beyond. I have five issues. Tim Tyler, uh, you mentioned him a minute ago. I think this is his longest running series. Ravage, mentioned by Tim Vigil in our interview. The guy with the chainsaw hand, I think, is we'll the be way seeing it that was, later. Uh, described. We'll be seeing that later in this same box. <laughs> I dig his stuff. When I started getting into him, it reminds me of like a cross between Vigil and like Image. You see like that double lit muscles and guys are, are really ripped up for what is an outlaw comic in spirit, but then. Almost an image comic in execution, you know, the metal That's textures. Incredible. Beautiful. Good stuff. <laughs> Still publishing through Fathom Press. Paul Mervides, Bob Dobb. I don't understand. Like this is you have to you have to be of that generation. But I I wanna understand. I'll take a look. You know? Yeah. But this is an image that would show up on all the old Underground Comics guy stuff, including like Robert Crumb would use yeah, it sometimes. Yeah, he was part of that, uh, what, it was a church, right? It was like a startup. Church of the Subgenius. Yes. Born to Kill, Air Cell. Born to Kill is a good name for anything. Yeah. That's early Air Cell. Oh, 91. no, that's late air cell. I thought it looked different and weird. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that font. <laughs> wonder if that's that label maker thing. This, this may surprise you, but, but uh, Rack published some interesting stuff, man. 
I, I pick I, up racks whenever I find them. I do too, but never one has never been as engaging to me as this one. Interesting. We should say, uh, so we know Rack because of Chake and the Forever Man Sega game. Pretty big deal, pretty big success. But he was based in Ohio, so he would show up at Pittsburgh shows. And it was like a self-publishing dude that had a video game. Man, that seemed like the American dream. The guy. Yeah. You know, and this thing, like, the Rack comics are very rough. Um, very, like, front view, side view. Yes. So this is like... One that isn't. Yeah, I was wondering. It must be a different artist. Yes. This does look nice. What do you know about this? Nothing at all, but uh, to me, this is probably like uh, when they talk cultural appropriation. Uh, if this ain't a Japanese dude who does this shit, which is not... Uh, th this might be the shit that they are talking about. Yeah, Flint, Michigan, Arrow, manga, Arrow being a publisher out of Flint. And then the it's like the excuse to get this girl as naked as possible, as often as possible. Little Adam Warney. Astonishing how many books Fantagraphics will publish, but re like refuse to put a cape on a guy, you know? So these monster comics, some of the Arrows comics, when I see them in the bins... I'll scoop them up, and this is uh, interesting enough cartoon. It's pretty attractive, yeah. Yeah. Good, good, solid black spotting, nice design. I often forget about their their imprints, like that right. monster imprint. Rescue mission. Awesome. Have all of these, scoop them all up again, and let's see, two, four, six, eight, one dollar, buck eighty cents. These are. This is an underrated series, in my opinion. This is one that I that Steve I picked Olive up. Color. They they look good. They read well. This is still good Jack Kirby comics. I know his skills slip as he gets later in his career. For my money, these are still pretty good, Me, solid comics. I think so as well. People rag on uh, Mike Thibodeau's inking. I have no problem with it. He's got a heavy hand, but who gives a fuck? Some great shots, like the big spaceship, two pagers. I, I like this series quite a bit. Yeah, I do too. Some fun backups as well. I would only, always see these when I was a kid. And, and that looks nice. Yeah, it's Dan Day, brother to uh, to Gene. And, you know, you don't read... Like, I'm not going to read this pile of hokum. But I really like the artwork. It's like doing their best. Uh, Bernie Wright's in Frankenstein kind of thing. Missing the mark a little bit, but still look, looking pretty interesting to me. But I would see these when I was a kid and just think that this is, like, the greatest drawings that were ever done by man. They look nice, you know, and in that context, for sure they would have stood out. Yeah, like you could see like some of the Bernie Wrights. This and stuff, stuff would here. speak to me as a kid because of the black and white. Mm -hmm. Like the black and white was so my focus. These are fun. I see these a lot, and this is a series that I always will see and be like, five, seven, eight? Because <laughs> I picked up like the first couple issues and was shocked to learn that it runs that far. This is, I think, a European cartoonist or series of graphic novels. Direct from Europe. There you go. That uh, that was imported and looks really good. It's action comics, you know, exploitation vein. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, the North American idiom in there, and you don't see that much on display in European comics. They have their own way of doing things. I grabbed this because I'm like, it's like kind of like Barry Windsor totally Smith -ish Barry or Windsor something. Smith. And uh, whoa, that, that looks nice. Doesn't disappoint. No, that looks good inside. Now I wonder if I have this, because it looks very familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's hard to remember when you start picking these things up at 20 cents a clip. It's true. And in fact, I, I have a, a handful of doubles from this very yeah, box. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I must you. always end up with that. Constellation Graphics, 86, coming Perfect. out of Texas. Perfect. Yeah, these are outsider comics. Yeah. You see, they're not coming out of the normal channels. That 1986 is just alarms go off for me many 1986 gimmicks here you know this one i don't think so i've never seen this this has uh storman artwork Ooh, craig storman we're going to talk about him in the future yeah just a penciler on this baby lettering maybe no oh yeah oh you know what he He's was the, the anchor. anchor yeah uh, yeah and lettering his lettering is very distinct it's just an odd one. I have some of these. Great cover. Yes. 
Yeah, this is kind of in the vein of those um, Lovecraftian sci-fi anthology. Very many rungs below, like a heavy metal, but maybe inspired by it. I grabbed these for some early Alex Alexander Maleev artwork. Yeah, I've picked these up in the past, just craving some crow. Yeah. It's not James O'Barr. It does look good. Maleev was pretty good from, from the beginning. Like, he did some Predator stuff, I think, early on in his in his run here. And uh, It looks nice, but it's not James O'Barr. Yeah, Crucial uh, Fiction, another uh, Fantagraphics book. This is one of the doubles. It's in the stack over there for you if you'd like like a copy. Yeah, I haven't seen this before. Fantagraphics published so many of these books where they just didn't go on to be 8-Ball or Hate. And you find them sometimes, and it'll be... I don't know. Do you know this cartoonist? Have yeah. you seen him on anything else? Julian Lawrence. It looks great, but never heard of it before. The Crypt. This is approaching. This this was like that iffy thing where it's like it's a little too formed, but I'll give it a shot. Yeah, it can it's be hard to judge this it's stuff. It's just interesting enough, and it cost me 20 cents. That's why you bring it home. Mm -hmm. You also bring... Hell yeah! Any, any uh, kudo reprints or whatever, or this might have been, this might be new material. Yeah, it looks new, newer because uh, kudo was in uh, Caliber Presents the first probably six issues, uh, along with the early Crow stuff. But you could always tell the period of uh, Tim Vigil by by how much he sort of leans on that anatomy, how much he lights it and stuff. Curse of Baby Monster, Starhead, that was uh, Mac White's company. R.K. Sloan. There's a few issues of this that float around. This is a pretty odd object. I don't know too much about it, but that R.K. Sloan, I think, did some mini-comics as well. Pete Bag piece right there. Nice skateboarding, no less. Painted comics before the days of uh, Alex Ross, I guess. Cyberpunk. I like the idea. I like how this looks. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty cool, man. Yeah. I haven't seen this before. Is this innovation? Yeah. Yeah, one of the one of those indie publishers that jumped into the color comics world from the get-go pretty much. Daryl Banks. That's a that's a mainstream guy. Yeah, did he draw Green Lantern? Yeah, one of those DC one of them DC shit. Dangle by the great Lloyd Dangle. I think this is a photograph, am I right? He looks, like sculpted this in some like kind of play doh with a back with a backdrop. Painted backdrop. Drawn in quarterly, so this is an example of you know their their early days of publishing cartoonist anthology one person anthologies. Hart Fisher, grab any Boneyard presses you find, man. That's true. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Another outlaw. Wow. And we're really going to read your prose story. <laughs> I pulled out his teeth. <laughs> this this is pretty uh, interesting visually. Yeah. Doesn't look like a lot of other comics. <laughs> Just listen to us scream. <laughs> Dark Assassin. Sweet. What the heck? Silver Wolf. Is it Silver Wolf or Greater Mercury? This one's a Greater Mercury. Yeah. Look at his body of work. The, the back catalog. <laughs> <laughs> there was there was one Silver Wolf book down there. It was a Silver Wolf uh, trivia book. Yes, I have it. Big piece of shit. Yes. <laughs> In that way, not much different than the uh, other Silver Wolf. <laughs> Dark Star. I have a different issue of Dark Star. Like none of them are numbered, so I don't know which oh, one's weird. first okay. and, and, and second. But uh, these are. If I had any, if I had it to do over again, when we had uh, access to Tim Vigil, I would have asked him about like some of this other stuff that they published that, that they didn't draw and shit. And I, I got some examples here. Spring Hill, Yeah, Spring I would be Hill curious. Th this is an interesting one because the paper is this coated stock, so yeah. it's like really crisp black and white. Compliments to art. Yeah. Well, next time we talk to him. Next well, time we're hanging out with Tim. Yeah, which will be easy. Uh, another uh, Tim Tyler piece, man. Another, res another rescue mission because I have... The I just have two issues. Were there more than two? I don't know how many of these. They, you know, they blend together a little bit because you pick this stuff up in such a fragmentary way. Pretty good looking. Yeah. In the game for a long time. Yeah, that's early Tim Tyler, 86. More of the Day Brothers. Like, they did a lot of work in fanzines. They did a lot of work for, like, Star Reach and places like that. Little Rambo 2 homage. Yeah. <laughs> 
And I think that might be where some of this material comes from. Not quite sure, but the point of getting the shit is to educate yourself. Yeah, those look nice. I haven't seen these. Dead World, but not Vince Locke. Ah. Yeah. There were... Dead World was, I think, successful enough that they ended up doing spin-offs and multiple volumes and things. More vampire stuff. I'm not as excited by this one as the previous. Yeah, I agree. But that's kind of crying like <laughs> This actually looks better than I than I mean, I this expected. is this is uh, Bernie Wrightson, is it not? It looks oh, like Oh, yeah, him. yeah, that's him. That might have been in a fanzine. From 1970, it's very early for him. Death Hunt, another good good title. <laughs> you skip this bullshit. You yeah. skip that bullshit and this bullshit. <laughs> wow. And then you just get into the comic. A lot of these comics, I can't help but think that they are just like Dungeons & Dragons campaigns brought to the comics page. Right. Hell yeah. <laughs> Joe Vigil's masterpiece, Dog. Three issues have been published to this. I actually, this is my favorite issue. Uh-huh. I've never seen issue three. And if I have, I might have doubles of issue three. I'll have to check. Oh, we'll trade. And I recently just picked up a page from this, which we will definitely show off in the near future. This is one that I looked at. might still be available. Um, but I have a showdown with a giant spider monster. There this thing, that's not my page, though. This is my page. So you get a little bit of tiny dog facing this giant monster. Yeah, yeah, good foreshortening and, and graffiti-like. This is another one of those, uh, like Dark Star, where it's a very crisp, mm -hmm. sharp printing. So you get all of the little bits of ink line. Very. This is probably his most obsessive inking, in my opinion. And also duo shade paper, so like it prints really nicely. That might have been part of the reason they, they chose this this paper. No, the rescue mission, man. Ooh, man, what a find. Domu, always grab those from any dollar dollar stash or less. Wow. So hard to find this. It just is not printed enough. There just aren't enough copies for the demand, so anytime you find this, you grab it. Here's a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I go down there, I find some Domus. Yeah, I, I've found several, too, over the years, and... It's great comics. Gotta grab those. 20 cents for a domu. Yeah. So after uh, Air Cell comes Nightwind. Is that how it works? Mm, I don't know. Is it, that true? Because it's still Barry Blair. What's the year? 92. Yeah. Is Malibu it, publishing this? A lot of questions. K Favors put something <laughs> in the comments. It's possible that, you know, he was unhappy with the Malibu deal and struck out on his own. You know, this could be another Barry Blair. I believe there's still like like you know, company. there's Dale Keown gimmicks in here, so yeah. I think it's reprinting some of the early uh Dragon Rings or something. Yeah, that's that's a weird era of comics, man. A lot of so much stuff came out of Barry Blair's like publishing imprint. And we'll be looking at some of that stuff. Including yeah, the we'll Dragon Rings I've been missing. At some point couple issues I've been missing. No idea that there was a volume two. <laughs> and then, of course, Dragon Force, where we get some of the proto Del Keown By early artwork. By the way, we often confuse comics, like old black and white comics, where it'll be like, oh, trailer trash, no, white trash. <laughs> Dragon Force and Dragon Ring from the same, same publisher? Pub <laughs> You're not helping yourself, man. <laughs> One more Dragon Force bit. These are nice. The color, they, they did some color too in the 80s, mm -hmm. air cell, and pretty interesting stuff. Looks like some of that's airbrushed, right? Yeah, and it's it's like really like faint. Like, it's cool, you know? Yeah, definitely. Comics don't look like this. <laughs> Del Keown was, was awesome from, from, he was always Del Keown. I think he referenced himself there. Probably. Handsome man. Probably. Duplex Planet, one of the... Staples of Fantagraphics, 1990s. Tales from the uh, old folks' home. The Edge, some more Greater Mercury. Do you have this one? I don't. You do now, because I accidentally got doubles. <laughs> Grips is in there. Sweet. He should be in everything. Unless that's the Edge. <laughs> and, he, he, and they have several heroes who have just one uh, claw. Sometimes I ask myself... What was the interest in getting this? And then I realized it was that guy who does that Dark Angel comic, and I really like his stuff. Yeah, I think I have this, and I, I wouldn't have been able to tell you why, either. <laughs> Some more Barry Blair, Elf World. This feels like 
near and dear to Barry Blair's heart. Totally. Once again, another one of those Dungeons and Dragons type campaigns. Elves Not were such comics. a big vein of like indie comics. Elves were first, Turtles come, come second, so it's like they're all just trying to glom on to like previous successes. Grab some Joe Stat, and like I never seen the original E Man's, always saw uh, reprints in the first comics, so what the fuck, I'll check them these out. These are, uh, Eric Larson used to just really plug these in the back of Savage Dragon. Really? Yeah. Well, Joe Staten, and specifically Starman. Empire Lanes, check out this insanity. That's a 1986 book. No, uh,. No areas left very white on the page. That's nice. <laughs> Look at that There's shit. some really nice p panels there. Why Empire Lanes, though? That makes me think of a bowling comic. <laughs> Escape Velocity. This is one of those weird examples of, like, the painted cover doesn't look anything like the interior. Yeah. And it's also the anthology of different artists, so the, the quality certainly varies in the inside. Equine the Uncivilized. Signed, man. <laughs> <coughs> is the signature what made you bring it home? Absolutely. Reagan Raiders ad. So weird, man. It is weird. Th like there were there were veins of furry comics. There were. Fat Ninja is my very first Silver Wolf comic. It wasn't Grips. I came across this shit in my uncle's like piles that he threw my way, man. Well, it's sort of Grips. Yeah. This is what Grips is drawing when he's not out there eviscerating people on the streets. He's a cartoonist. And his comic book is Fat Ninja. Such a cool concept. How about that onomatopoeia? <laughs> Radicate his back cover. Hero Illustrated is something we're going to cover at least one issue of. And a lot of people don't realize, like, they were a comics publisher for, for quite a ways, man. Um, this is 1988. They were publishing comics even up into the speculator market. And in an era where McFarlane and Liefeld are out, all of their comics still looked this way. Look at how gratuitous that is. <laughs> all of their comics still look this way. So you can imagine these motherfuckers could not compete with Image Comics in any way, shape, or form. And they made the pivot. This is actually kind of interesting. They made the... Mark Beecham. This is a guy ah, that uh, yes. Tim Vigil brought up. Um, they made the pivot into publishing a wizard-like magazine and it's were wild. able to sustain their careers for a little bit longer oh yeah that has that has nothing to do with uh captain marvel i think this looks kind of good i did not know that about hero that they published comics before you told me that ed so this this is a weird book i have this and i can't make heads or tails of it <laughs> did you try to read it yet not really yeah like this is one where it's like i gotta sit down with this thing and see what see what these guys are, got, are trying to communicate to me man because that's an odd design very, very odd. In a post like Megaton Man Tick universe, yes. it's like, oh, we're going to introduce a third guy with a big chin. Hey, you said it all with the turtles and furries and elves. Whatever sells, man, you'll see lots of imitations. Would you call this outsider? Uh, yeah, I'd probably call that outsider. Forever now. This is one I picked up whenever I got interested in the 80s black and white stuff. It's definitely outside of the, of the system. Issues. This is the other gimmick that you'll see lots of publishers do. Oh, Frankenstein, public domain. Absolutely. Let's this put one, that name on our book. Jim Somerville cover. Yeah. Maybe on all of them. No, just uh, just uh, maybe this one too. But uh, drawn by Pat Olive, probably real early work from Pat Olive, and very fucking good. Yeah, I'll say. Wow. Very good. Written by this, uh, I believe it's that Martin Powell guy. Yeah, this Martin Powell dude who in like Wizard issue number two, he had about five. Uh, uh, Dracula books coming yes. out, and one of them was called Dracula 1990. <laughs> the magazine came from 1992, and you said, oh, it's a period piece. <laughs> <laughs> from Beyond. You know from, from Beyond? Al Columbia's first work, if S I'm not mistaken. Super early Al Columbia. Do you have these? I have one of them. I have another. Uh, I got a double, so there's one over there, uh, and hopefully uh, it's one that you don't have. Yeah, pretty, what is pretty, uh, pretty interesting. I didn't know there were this many of them. That's number four. I wonder if that's, all, if that's as far as it went. Do you know who published this? Was this a self-published gig? Is that Slave Labor? I don't know. Studio Insidio. So that was an I, not an L. Wow, that's an image. One before we get out of here, man. Frontier, 
Paul Duncan, Steve Pugh, known uh, known in the British comic scene, Steve Pugh, put out by slave labor. Uh, the Europeans have a fondness for westerns, and like I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of it. My all my dad would do is watch John Wayne movies, but I love these guys' take on the western. It's the same way as. Um, the way the British invasion affected superhero comics, the British invasion that affected like Western stuff, like it is a thing in and of its own. And it's not even Brit it's European, we'll say. Okay. The, the right. European Western stuff. I'm thinking of Lieutenant Blueberry and shit like that too, man. Well, I think of all the Clint Eastwood movies. Yeah, the spaghetti you know, like, westerns. Like it's not just comics. Yeah. Oh man. Jim I'm powder now, dude. Let's get the hell out of here. Like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell icon, and we'll notify you whenever we have fresh videos available. You can pick up our t-shirts and merch through our spread shop, link below the video. We didn't grab these comics just to, like, make videos, man. We have business to attend to with them. Give them their marching orders, Jimmy. Read more comics.